You see on the screen a rendition of Christopher Columbus, and I want to find out how many of you are as old as I am. I know you're out there. <laughs> but see if you remember this song that I learned in elementary school. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I see ya. <laughs> he sailed and sailed and sailed and sailed to find this land for me and you. I have no idea why I remember that. And that gives you some sense, at least, of how powerful that was, how, how that got kind of drilled into my brain. And of course, when you're in elementary school, you don't question what you're learning. You assume the teachers know everything, and so that these things must be true. So I know that uh, Columbus <laughs> discovered America in 1492. I know that up until Columbus, uh, everybody thought the world was a cube, and that if you sailed too far, you would fall off the edge of it. And only Columbus had figured out that actually the world was round. And this is a bit of cultural mythology, right? This is one of our origin stories. And the way I know that is that this painting, which is 12 feet by 18 feet, is one of eight that encircles the rotunda in the United States Capitol, about 400 yards from where I work at the National Museum of the American Indian. So this is our origin story, one of them. There are many, and I'm going to talk about some more of them. But think how powerful that notion is, that Columbus discovered America. There was nothing here. There was nobody here until Columbus arrived in America. Now, I got a little confused as a kid because I knew I was an Indian, and I knew that Indians were here first. Um, and so I, I was puzzled, but hey, it's a good song, so I sang along with all the other kids. <laughs> so, but if we look at this mural, there over on the right side, uh, kind of at the bottom, and you can barely make it out, but there are some people there. And by the way, don't these sailors look remarkably fresh for spending several weeks on a 15th century sailing vessel? But it's mythology, and so that's as it should be. Another of our, our origin myths, the first Thanksgiving. I, I really like this one, because um, it involves food, and I'm very fond of that. We all know this story. Right? The pilgrims arrived in New England in 1620, stepped onto Plymouth Rock. Sorry to burst your bubble, there is no Plymouth Rock. It's, it's something they made up. But it's kind of, again, it's a cool story, it's a myth. So they arrive at this place, which they named Plymouth, and uh, they were fleeing religious oppression in Europe, came to the New World to find freedom. And there they met a friendly Indian named Squanto, and because he was a friendly Indian, he taught them to grow corn. And so a year hence, uh, they had a great harvest and celebrated uh, the providence of God and celebrated their new Indian friends, invited them over for a, a harvest feast, eat, play a little football. <laughs> it was really a fine day all around. So is that true? Well, yeah, kind of. It's true. But here's some more of the story. And one of the important things that we do as Americans or as human beings is we make choices about what we want to remember and what we want to forget. So here's some more of the story. Turns out, Squanto, who we think his real name was Tesquantum, something like that. When Tesquantum first met the pilgrims, he spoke English. Did you know that? I didn't know that until just a few years ago. Tisquantum spoke English. Come strolling into the pilgrim village. Hey, what's up? You know. <laughs> so imagine their surprise. Imagine my surprise. Well, it turns out Tisquantum had been kidnapped by an English fishing vessel captain and, uh, and was taken to Europe and sold. He was later redeemed and made his way back to New England, only to find that his entire town, the town where he came from, had been wiped out in a smallpox epidemic. So the way the pilgrims survived that first long winter in New England was they found the stores of food that the Wapanoags had set aside uh, before their arrival and before the arrival of the smallpox epidemic. 
So now we've got a different story, a more interesting story. And Tusquantum becomes not the friendly Indian, not, not sort of a, uh, uh, an imaginary Indian, but more of a real person, somebody who is, is much more complex. The rest of the story is more interesting and more important still. About 50 years after that first Thanksgiving, by the way, they didn't really do it every year. We kind of made that up. I mean, we give thanks all the time, right? But it wasn't a big thing. They didn't say, hey, remember that thing we did with the Indians last year? Let's do it again. <laughs> didn't happen. So about 50 years later, there were new generations of pilgrims, new generations of Wampanoags, and the Wampanoags had sold so much of their land to the pilgrims that they had fallen into poverty themselves. And they struck out. They lashed out, and there was a great conflagration known as King Philip's War. And King Philip's War was perhaps the most devastating war in the entire history of North America in terms of the, the percentage of people who were killed in this conflict. And the tribes in New England were virtually wiped out. Those that weren't wiped out were confined and no longer really the powers that they had once been. The pilgrims were so angry that when they captured Philip, they took his head and posted it on a pike at the entrance to Plymouth and left it there for 20 years. Now we've got a really different story, right? And it's no longer this happy story of brave voyagers and racial harmony and all that, but it's a much more important story because that's how we know that event King Philip's War did more to define what would follow in North America than pretty much anything else. And yet, most of us don't know that story. We don't know this important part of our own history. Our origin myths in America mostly include Indians. And this is, this is interesting, right? Um, it includes Tisquantum or Squanto. Uh, it includes Pocahontas, it includes uh, Sacagawea, it includes Osu Yahola. All of these were very important figures in American history, and yet in each case, they've been rendered imaginaries. They're imaginary Indians. We know very little about the very real people who they were, and the very real impact they had not just on their Native American communities, but on America and on the world. And that's too bad, because it's an extraordinarily rich story. But it's also too bad because America has a bit of a love affair with these imaginary Indians. Because imaginary Indians can be anything we want them to be. They can fill any role that we might choose for them. They can be what we need to tell a good, happy story. And that is at the expense of real Indians, the real Indians who are with us today. Imaginary Indians don't have problems. They don't make demands. They don't prick the conscience the way that contemporary Indians do. But furthermore, they disguise the real Indians that are making enormous contributions to our world today. I would urge you to find appropriate ways, rather than honoring Native people on the side of football helmets and that sort of thing, but to honor real people like Specialist Lori Paestua. She was a Hopi soldier and one of the first American soldiers killed in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Or even more recently, Master Sergeant Joshua Wheeler. He was the Delta soldier who was killed this week rescuing hostages from ISIS. These are real American heroes, nothing imaginary about them. And yet, most of us would never know that these were Native people and that they had sacrificed in the manner they had. We can change this. We can. Because it is changing. Remember Columbus? Well, there's a movement out there to do away with Columbus Day. And I'm not endorsing it, I just think it's interesting. And so major cities like Portland and Seattle, Albuquerque, 
have already said, we're not going to celebrate Columbus Day anymore. We're going to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. South Dakota has long since celebrated Native American Day instead of Columbus Day. The state of Alaska just this year announced that they too will celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day rather than Columbus Day. Because what we've learned about Columbus over the years is not very attractive. What we've learned is that, well, he murdered and enslaved and absolutely plundered the prosperous people of the Caribbean. And do we really want to celebrate somebody who would engage in that sort of conduct? You see, we decide generation by generation. We still get to decide what to remember and what to forget. And so this is an ongoing process. Take this fellow on the screen here. Now this is, uh, everybody knows who that is, right? General Custer, who died valiantly fighting the Sioux and Cheyenne Indians at Little Bighorn. Actually, this is Errol Flynn playing General Custer. <laughs> so when I was a kid, once again, I read this book, and Custer was a hero, man. And, and the Indians, they were, they were villains. And I watched this movie some Saturday, maybe more than one. And once again, Errol Flynn was, uh, he was Custer. He was a hero. He was brave. He was hardy. He was all of those. He was honest, honest as the day is long. And actually, the way they tell the story in this particular movie, Errol Flynn liked the Indians. He was fighting on their behalf, but he was betrayed by government bureaucrats and corporations. Wow. <laughs> so, but just in my lifetime, Custer's reputation has just gone right down the tubes, right? And so it's rare to find a historian these days who say, oh, Custer was a brilliant general, Custer was a great guy. Nobody says that anymore. Uh, in fact, I sort of mark his ultimate denouement uh, when the movie Little Bighorn came out. I know some of you are old enough to remember Little Big Man as well. And the depiction of Custer in that movie told me that the popular culture had turned on him entirely and that Custer was through. And that's pretty much uh, the way it's turned out. So we change. Again, we choose. We decide. Uh, our culture decides. We collectively somehow say, yeah, we're going we're gonna to turn the corner on this Custer guy and move on to something else. <coughs> that brings me to this guy. You may have heard of him. I understand uh, that there are cities and towns and counties uh, named for Andrew Jackson. I don't want you to take it as simply as he was the villain who enacted the Indian Removal Act and was responsible for the Trail of Tears. Uh, you know, the Trail of Tears almost left our cultural memory. In fact, it did leave our cultural memory for the better part of a century after it happened. Nobody wanted to talk about it. It wasn't in the textbooks. But it was because Cherokee scholars and activists coined this phrase, Trail of Tears, and said, people need to remember this that it actually re-entered the national memory. We need not to think of the Trail of Tears as an isolated tragedy. It was an astonishing endeavor to clear all the Indians from the Appalachians to the Mississippi, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf, and move them all across the Mississippi River, many of them to my home state, Oklahoma. And ask yourself, what would we think of a nation if it were somebody else, what would we think of a country that would do such a thing? And given that it did happen, how should we think about it today and what should we do about it today? We need to embrace our entire history and we need not to be afraid of it. I'm just amazed. Uh, the more I read, the less I know. And yet, I am endlessly amazed by what I learn about us, all of us. And one of the things that is clearest to me is there's no such thing as Native American history. There's no such thing as African American history or Irish American history or any of that other stuff. There's just history. All of our ancestors were part of it, and it is absolutely magnificent. It is heroic. It is tragic. It is beautiful. It is desperately ugly at times. But it's ours, and we inherit it. And that helps us understand who we are and why we are the way we are today.